from the University of Minnesota, Rochester, our town. Recently, the City of Rochester conducted resident focus groups to hear directly from community members. The focus groups were part of a larger strategic priorities process. Here to tell us more is Rochester City Administrator Steve Reimer. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Well, welcome back. We had yeah, you when you first absolutely. started here. Yeah, no, I appreciate you guys inviting me back. Of course. Um, can you tell us a little bit, walk us through what the strategic priorities process um, has looked like and, and what it's what it's uh, about? Okay. Well, really what's it about, uh, as the name says, strategic priorities is for the city council to really establish that direction for us. So as an organization, we know where they'd like us to go. And so rather than just having the council um, spend some time in and let us know, we really wanted to build the base and the base was from the community and the team that works for the city. And so we went through a pretty comprehensive process that included a um, community survey, a teammate survey, okay. and we took all that information and working with a consulting firm and brought that forward to the council. As part of that, we also look at focus groups. And so as, after we got survey results, we wanted to do a little deeper dive, if you will, into some of the things we heard. And so we did that with community members. And I want to thank all of the individuals that did join us. We had many, many people join us and share their thoughts, as well as we did internal focus groups uh, to make sure we understand exactly what the employees were saying. And so we brought all that to the city council ultimately for a, a day of a strategic priority advance, as we call it. Great. So can you tell us a little bit about what the community focus groups look like? What were some of the feedback, some of the takeaways from mm -hmm. that? Well, overall, we had very strong survey results. Uh, people are very uh, satisfied uh, living and working and uh, recreating in this community. Uh, they appreciate all the public amenities, um, and it really came down to the people and places is what people really uh, gravitate towards. Uh, but that being said, we also wanted to understand some of those areas that either we could um, uh, expand on the things that were working, and on the other side, what are the things that maybe we could be looking at a little better? and things like making sure we're an inclusive community. Mm -hmm. We really strive for that, but we can always work on that, making sure that diversity and equity is a key part sure. of our community. And so hearing themes like that uh, was a key thing, as well as then some of the you know more traditional ones, like our infrastructure and our roads and things like that. But really looking at how we as a community uh, you know, embrace that word community and how we can work together a little closer. And so what's next? What are, are there certain phases to the strategic priorities uh, process? What, are, what does that look like in terms of a timeline and stages? Mm -hmm. So about a week ago, the council spent an entire day uh, as I said in the advance and they uh, selected four different priorities as well as working on a vision statement and so we are finalizing that we're going to go to a committee a whole meeting here in August on August 20th and then ask them to adopt and then once they're adopted we really want it to be a living document if you will this is not a one-time thing we put on the shelf it's uh, to your question it's we really want to make sure that uh, our team is engaged all the time with the community that it continues to evolve that we get better at it that we learn it's a point in time and we want to understand if we're if we're still heading in the right direction and so our plan is uh, this continual engagement and communication and then every other year uh, go through a formal process of a community survey and test some of the things uh, to understand if we're making progress or not. So that continued communication um, is going to go throughout the entire in, entire process in terms of getting focus groups and surveys? Yeah, actually communication and engagement are really, we're trying to make that part of our culture okay. as an organization okay. and really trying to make it who we are. Mm -hmm. So it's not, it's not something extra we're doing, right. but it's something that we always are doing. And so that's part of the strategic priority process. It's part of how we bring projects forward for public infrastructure. It's how we plan programs, different policies. So it's much more comprehensive than the priorities, but the priorities give us that compass, if you will. Sure, and for folks listening, um, how can you, how can they get involved? What can, can they be looking at the website? How can they uh, be giving their feedback on a continual basis, mm -hmm. be part of this culture of communication? Yeah, great question. Thank you for asking it. So we did learn that our website is one of the key ways of communicating with our um, community and so continually we we'll want to keep that updated so look at that uh, you know be involved at, at public meetings we're going to expand our social media presence we're just hiring our first communications and engagement manager she's joining us next Thursday and so all those pieces we're just going to keep building it and so if people have ideas of way of engaging either in person or through social media or different ways of technology you know we're open and open to all that okay. and I know a lot of us we're hearing a lot about different plans from different sectors of the community and part of the city how does the strategic planning process sort of um, I guess coordinate with other part, other development is, um, uh, components in the in the city, like DMC or some other things. Yep, uh, those are all factors that the council use to figure out what the priorities are. In fact, one of their priorities, their third priority, is to manage growth and development. Another is to 
uh, make sure that we balance our public infrastructure investment. So we look at how we're um, investing in our current amenities as well as bringing on new amenities. And so it all plays together. And that's one of the key things about this is that we want to make sure that we are coordinating efforts mm -hmm. and we're not duplicating, we're consistent in what sure. we're trying to do. And so there's a lot of stuff happening here and it, you know, that's part of the putting the puzzle together. Great. Well, thank you for joining us again, Steve. I'm sure we'll be seeing you again as we go through this process. Thank you. Thanks a lot. is brought to you in part by the following amazing people and organizations. The Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota. And the members of KSMQ Public Television. Thank you. Stick around to meet someone who's working to make Rochester the healthiest city for all. Get a walkthrough of the newly renovated Rochester International Airport and book lovers enjoyed this community favorite for nearly 100 years. Up first, find out what makes the garden at RCTC so smart in this week's Our Culture segment. I like to look at the therapeutic part of it as the number of people that come through our garden and for the pure enjoyment or to maybe to relax. We have people who will come out here and just read, um, have their lunch out here. I'm Robin and I'm the horticulture program leader and this is the RCTC Smart Garden. The SMART Garden is located at RCTC and SMART stands for Sustainable, Medicinal, Artistic, Resourceful, and Therapeutic. And the SMART Garden was started in 2002. It came about from some funding that we received. Everything in the garden from the plants to the pond to the even the structures, the wooden structures, the gazebo, have been designed, built, and uh, installed and of course are maintained by the faculty and students in the RCTC horticulture program. So the garden is divided into a number of different spaces. If you were to take a walk through our butterfly garden, some of the interesting plants in that butterfly garden would be um, our Asclepias, basically called our butterfly weed. I like to refer to it more or less butterfly plant instead of calling it a weed. But um, it is a primary food source for the larvae of the monarch butterfly. We also, in that garden, another interesting plant is cup flower, which is a native plant, which can reach up to eight feet tall. On the fence in the butterfly garden, we have honeysuckle vine, uh, which attracts uh, a, lot of, a number of pollinators and specifically even hummingbirds. We, we've developed the pond garden to the point now that it actually has become its own ecosystem, which means that it actually requires little maintenance compared to what it did when we first started it. Another good example of sustainable um, would be the, the small prairie gar area that we have. Um, again, after those initial years of establishment, it also has now become kind of a low maintenance area and it has become its own kind of micro ecosystem. We have a small fruit orchard in that we have two apple trees, two pear trees, a plum tree, and a cherry tree in the fruit orchard. The fruit trees are netted to try and keep the Japanese beetles from feeding on them. There are a number of what we call hardscaping elements in the garden. So the first hardscape element that was actually built in the garden was the gazebo. It was actually, originally it was a kit donated by the class of 2001. The class of 2001 was the group of students who did a lot of lobbying for the funding that we received. So that kind of has special meaning in that, you know, it was the first um, element in the garden. I just want to welcome anyone to visit the garden anytime. It's free and open to the public. I think it's even a great place to come during the winter months.
For more information about this story and other Our Town features, connect with us on Facebook, Twitter at KSMQ hashtag Our Town, or ksmq.org slash Our Town. Wanna tell me where you've been? I've been on the road for months, staying up too late, open to hear from you again. I've been holding out for one. With all the construction taking place in the city, parking can definitely be a challenge. Plus, some meters take coins, other credit cards. It can get really confusing. But now the city of Rochester has a new app for that. Park Mobile is a new app for your phone that allows you to identify meters and pay for parking at nearly 1,500 parking meters in Rochester. The app is free to download on both Apple and Android devices. And an added bonus, Park Mobile covers 10 million spaces in more than 3,000 locations across the country. So you can use it when you travel as well. More information at parkmobile.io. And if you're looking for a new way to beat the heat this summer, check out the inflatable water park at Foster Erin Park. There are slides, ladders, trampolines, monkey bars, and more installed on the pond, so no fall falling off is no problem. The Foster Erin Park Beach is open Monday through Friday from noon to 8 p.m. and weekends from 10 a.m. to 8 p.m. The inflatable water park does have an admission fee and life jackets are required. And it's fair time. The Olmsted County Free Fair will be July 23rd through 29th at Grand Park. There'll be cl classic midway rides, agriculture exhibits, competitions, entertainment, and food. Yes fair food. My favorite, of course, is funnel cake. Admission is free. Parking is $5 a day or $20 for the week. Visit OlmsteadCountyFair.com for all the details. And now is the time when many local gardens are looking their best, so it must be time for the tour with the Master Gardeners. On July 26, visit six unique gardens and talk with the University of Minnesota Extension Master Gardeners to get all your questions answered about creating your own personal oasis. Tickets are $8 in advance, 10 at the door. Tickets are available at Sargent's Landscaping, and if you have more questions, call 507-261-6860. Coming up next, take a tour of the newly completed renovations at the Rochester International Airport in this week's Walkabout segment. We're talking about the U.S. Customs Project, very critical project uh, for the community uh, and for Rochester International Airport. Hi, my name is John Reed. I'm the executive director for Rochester International Airport. It's a $12 million uh, expansion here in the terminal that encompasses the U.S. Customs facility, as well as getting all of our ticket counters and our bag claim units in one area expanding our TSA checkpoint and adding some restrooms beyond the checkpoint. We think it's gonna offer better service uh, to our international customers that do come here uh, to Southeast Minnesota and to Rochester. Um, the new uh, U.S. Customs facility, about a 20,000 square foot uh, uh, facility contained here in the main terminal building, it's gonna be able to offer some of our passengers that do come on their private aircraft better access um, in a safe and secure area. Uh, for those that come in uh, wide, narrow body aircraft, they'll be able to pull that aircraft right up to our jet bridges. Um, and hopefully it does offer a quicker, faster way in and out of our community. Uh, we think it's going to offer better service to the general public as they're flying in and out of here. Delta, American, United are all partners here. Um, so all those ticket counters are located in the same place instead of being split before. Our U.S. Um, uh, TSA uh, checkpoint, it was time to upgrade. Um, we were able to bring at that same time full, uh, full TSA pre-check, which has hopefully allowed the uh, influx of passengers that we've got now a quicker way through the checkpoint. We hope people flying domestically, that they do see and feel these new improvements. We've heard a lot about Destination Medical Center and its goal to make Rochester America's city for health. But what does a healthy community really look like? This guy right here is working to make Rochester America's healthiest city for all. Stay tuned. Our past, remembering what made us who we are today. Brought to you by the History Center of Olmsted County. In 1883, M.G. Spring opened a bookstore that would become a fixture in Rochester as Adams Bookstore. In 1901, after passing through several owners, Henry Adams purchased the store located in the Massey Building. 
In addition to books, items for sale included games, gifts, stationery, and fountain pens. One notable patron was Helen Amelia Thompson Sunday, wife of revivalist Billy Sunday. She was photographed perusing books during her stay at the Cook Hotel in 1906. In August 1917, the Rochester Daily Post and Record reported a rare book at the store, published way back in 1713. The book is difficult to read. It is interesting, however. Photographs show hordes of people looking into the store's windows, eager to have a look at the old book. After Adam's death in 1937, his daughter Mildred managed the store until 1965, when she sold it to Farnham's Stationery of Minneapolis. Unfortunately, the store closed in 1967. health, we often think about our bodies, going to the doctor, making sure we stay fit. But there's a lot that plays into how healthy we are as individuals and as a community. Our environment and social factors determine a great deal and impact every, everything from the quality of the air we breathe to our ability to afford a safe place to live and get a good night's rest. Rick Morris from the Rochester Sierra Club joins us today to talk about his efforts. Welcome Rick. Thanks for having me Nicole. Of course. I'm going to jump right in. Mm -hmm. You've talked a lot about uh, Rochester being America's healthiest city. Mm -hmm. How do you feel we're doing in terms of being on that road to becoming America's healthiest city? I'd say we're definitely on the road. Um, the Destination Medical Center and Mayo Clinic have branded their initiative America's City for Health, which has a very much out there feeling. We're doing all this research, we're healing people's bodies, but it's for the whole world. So what me and my organization and the people I'm organizing with every day, we want to see a focus on making Rochester into America's healthiest city for the people who live here. Um, so that takes a whole lot of things. That means access to healthy food, no matter where you live in town or whether you have a car or not. Um, that means making sure our water quality and our air quality um, don't hurt you if you want to take a, a, a canoe for a paddle or whether you're walking around downtown. Um, so I'd say, Right now, Rochester still has to do a lot of work to just collect data, and that's one project I'm working on. But there is a real conversation going on about how, as Rochester is being built up, as we're developing, as we're changing the landscape, how do we make sure that those landscape changes make us a healthier city? That's great. How You've been part of some of these movements for 100% renewable energy here yeah. in town. How are those going? Uh, do you mm -hmm. have any updates on that? Oh, definitely. And I think this is a really exciting tie-in because we know that the way we extract fuels from the ground and burn them for electricity and energy has a huge impact on public health, both locally, around the state, around the country, around the world. Um, so right now, Rochester is powered by about 60% coal energy. Um, our municipal power company, RPU, is part of a larger power company called Simpa, and they're a part owner of a coal plant in uh, Becker, Minnesota. It's about 90 miles or so from uh, the Twin Cities. Um, however, back in 2015, our public utility company made a commitment to go 100% coal free by 2031. Okay. That's when our contract with our larger power provider is over. So on that one metric of how Rochester is contributing to global health and state health, um, we're on a very positive road to get off of coal energy. Now the next fight is to get off of natural gas, which we've been learning more and more has almost just as many public health impacts as coal. So right now the plan that RPU, Rochester Public Utilities, has in place is to basically replace all of our coal capacity or most of our coal capacity with um, natural gas. But we know that natural gas pipelines leak, um, we know that the extraction through fracking um, is really damaging to groundwater, wherever, whether that's in Canada or Colorado or Iowa. And we know that um, the pipelines themselves, as they're transferring um, the oil products, have a tendency to leak. It's not an if, it's a when. There's always going to be one. And some of the communities that are most impacted by these kind of public health and environmental health crises tend to be pretty marginalized community, whether they're native or indigenous communities or reservations or rural towns that don't have the, the local government strength to fight back against some of the biggest mm -hmm. corporations in the world. Um, so what um, my organization in town, uh, Sierra Club, all our volunteers, our activists and our allies, we're working to make sure that when that 2031 date comes, that we're poised to transition to 100% renewable energy and just leave this dirty fossil fuel thing in the past. Okay. Um, and one big update is the two days after Earth Day um, in April of this year, 
Rochester Public Utilities uh, committed to creating a plan for 100% renewable energy. Mm -hmm. So there's a plan that's getting written, it's going to be ready in less than a year, and then the next step will be to make sure that we implement that plan. And that's going to take all hands on deck. Sure. And in terms of um you know, I think a lot of people think about the Sierra Club, and mm -hmm. um, it's often, you know, it's an environmental organization. It's been around for decades and decades. Yeah, over 100 years <laughs> yeah. now. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, so, I mean, this, this your particular Sierra Club uh -huh. has been doing a lot of um, work with other communities and other organizations. Yeah. Um, how do you see this vision of um, environmental wellness and, mm -hmm. and health um, connected to other movements happening in the city? Yeah, well, at the end of the day, I think everyone in Rochester um, shares a vision for us being a really healthy community, a community where everyone's really welcomed and it doesn't matter what color your skin is, it doesn't matter where you come from in the world, it doesn't matter what your income level is, but you have a chance to thrive and really flourish here. Um, but we also have recognized through these partnerships that we have that that is not currently the case and that we have to do a lot of work to get there. Um, so we've been partnering with Rochester for Justice, which is a black civil rights organization, Cure Communities United for Rochester Empowerment, which is um, a movement to just organize poor people in town, um, immigrants in town, to really fight for their rights where they're not being represented. Um, and we've also uh, been working with a host of other environmental nonprofits as well to try to achieve this vision. And how do you build your volunteer base locally? Um, lots of things. We do fun stuff. So we had our summer picnic a couple of weeks ago where about 45, 50 people came out and we grilled and we got to know each other and we talked about this vision for Rochester that we want to create. Um, we do really basic organizing tactics. We'll go to doors in a neighborhood, knock on them, tell them about what we're working towards and ask if the people want to get involved. Um, and some other things we do when there's something important happening in town, say when um, Rochester Public Utilities is thinking about what their rates are going to be like for the next few years, like they're doing this Tuesday, um, we'll put out a call. We'll, we'll use all the media outlets in town and we'll try to educate the community, invite them in, um, tell them about why this particular decision is going to be important to their lives. And just something as kind of simple and boring as utility rates mm -hmm. can do a lot. Um, say a house uh, a lower income house is trying to put their yearly and monthly budget together, energy could make up 10%, 20%, 30% of some household budgets. So if we're able to, if we're able to make rates more just and more equitable, um, then it can really, really help out a family and give them more disposable income to spend on education and going out and um, having the life we all want to live in Rochester. Of course. What are some of the challenges um, that, that you face in terms of addressing some of the city's environmental issues? Some of the challenges, um, uh, one is education. Um, so until you're involved in a conversation, you might not realize how much the way we design our city is, the way we lay out our streets, where the city grows, where the city doesn't grow, mm -hmm. how all of those things contribute to public health. Um, another thing is the way we even design individual buildings has a lot to do with the health of the people that live in them. Yeah, can you tell us a little bit of, more about that? Sure. Um, so. There's, there's kind of two sides of this, resiliency and then, uh, and then your regular everyday health. So resiliency might be when the power goes out in the middle of winter, is the apartment building going to get deathly cold over the next five hours, 10 hours, 12 hours, 24 hours? Some of that has to do with how well it's insulated. Um, but some other things that, take, that have a part in that is whether there's like batteries in the building. Mm -hmm. So if the grid gets shut off, can we still maintain like, a ventilation system and the heating or the cooling that's important to keep people safe and to keep you know, food going and fresh water going? Um, so that's the resiliency piece. And especially as the city is investing more and more in affordable housing and figuring out how to make sure everyone has a safe, affordable, healthy place to live, this idea of resiliency is going to become increasingly important. And I know um, uh, there's some initiatives coming out of the DMC that are actually really helpful. Um, Kevin Bright, their sustainability director, has really been championing this cause, um, not only for all of our developments, but also within the conversation about um, how we fix affordable housing in town. Um, and then the other piece of that is um, like where, it, where housing and apartments are situated. Are they close to childcare? Are they close to a grocery store? Is it on a public transportation line? Is it close to a neighborhood park so people can get out and recreate in the green space and have trees around them and rejuvenate their spirits that way? Um, so there's a lot of these different pieces that come into play um, that kind of affect how someone's 
someone's health could be hurt or improved just by the place where they live. Sure. And one really interesting set of studies that I've been uh, researching lately, especially out of Boston, they've done a lot of good research out there, is that your zip code affects your life outcomes and your life expectancy far more than your genetic code does. And I think that, if nothing else, should be a really important to Rochester, a city that prides itself on taking care of people's bodies and health. Well, you've given us mm -hmm. a lot to think about, and um, we'll definitely be keeping tabs on what the Sierra Club is doing. And thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, thanks Rick. for having me. And thank you for joining us from the, Rochester, from the University of Minnesota, Rochester. We'll see you next week. Our town is produced by KSMQ Public Television, nonprofit, non-commercial. Please help pay for this programming by making a personal contribution at ksmq.org. Thank you.